now. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, so this week we are very happy to have uh, João Caetano from um, Simon's Center. He will tell us about uh, his recent work in G functions. Uh, please, João. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for uh, being here and also <coughs> for inviting me to give this uh, journal talk and also for uh, organizing this journal club and making the recordings available. That's very useful for those who cannot often attend live. Um, so uh, indeed, this is a uh, work uh, about uh, exact chief functions. So uh, the goal was to formula, reformulate this problem in terms of some uh, functional equations of the thermodynamic patterns at this type. Uh, and this is based on uh, this uh, work that appeared recently together with the Shota comment, so it appeared in April. <coughs> so let me uh, start by some brief introduction about the subject of functional equations. Uh, so of course, uh, functional equations in integrable field theories are, well, there are a very well known example, which is related to the spectrum of integrable field theories that we know very well. Uh, for example, uh, let's suppose we have a theory that uh, uh, contains just one type of particles. Uh, and let's consider, for example, the theory defined on some geometry that has periodic boundary conditions. So we know very well how to formulate the problem of the spectrum. So this is sort of a routine that we can apply for pretty much every uh, integrable field theory. So basically we start with the quantization condition, which is the asymptotic uh, beta and zats of the, the uh, excitations of the, the system, quantizing the moment of the excitations of the system. And uh, once we solve these equations, we can compute the energy of the spectrum uh, provided we know the dispersion relation. Uh, and this is exact up to uh, uh, non perturbative corrections, which are exponentially small in the volume. Nevertheless, this captures polynomial corrections in the volume. Uh, but often we, uh, we can also do better and we can uh, actually solve the problem in finite volume. And the uh, general strategy is to consider the theory not on an uh, infinite cylinder, but continue to the Euclidean torus. So we make time imaginary and we consider uh, the system at finite temperature. And then we take the limit where uh, this direction goes uh, to infinity so that uh, the partition function of the system gets dominated by uh, the ground state of the system at finite volume. Okay. <coughs> And now the advantage of doing that is that <coughs> by swapping space and time, so changing these directions, now we regard uh, what used to be the space as now periodic time. And uh, so this amounts to compute the, the same uh, partition function, but now the interpretation is that this partition function uh, is a thermal partition function in finite temperature and infinite volume. And the advantage of that is that now uh, computing quantities at finite temperature and infinite volume, we have a uh, sort of technique for that, which is goes by the name of thermodynamic beta and zats. And uh, the thermodynamic beta and zats is the first instance where uh, a functional equation uh, shows up. Okay. Uh, now, the important piece is that we are considering here some saddle point approximation, in the sense that we just care about this exponent. We don't care about possible finite pieces. And that's very important because uh, if we start asking about other types of quantities, like perhaps in next in complexity, you would, you would perhaps think of uh, form factors of local operators, or if you're more ambitious, perhaps correlation functions. Those typically involve those typically involve some order one pieces of the partition function. Uh, or finite pieces of the partition function, or in the case of the correlation function, it involves uh, the partition function with insertions. And that's, that's hard to compute. That's one of the reasons why we, we, we cannot have a systematic routine to compute other quantities besides this function, with one exception, and that exception is precisely the chief function. And even before telling you what the chief function is, let me say that that's perhaps the next to simplest quantity generalizes these considerations about the spectrum that I just made. And it's an order one quantity that we can compute pretty much in any field theory of time. But unfortunately, there's no thermodynamic that directly computes this quantity, 
and this is one of the goals of the project. Uh, <clears throat> so let, what, what is this chief function? So uh, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of this, of course, uh, but uh, let me be a little bit pedagogical here. So uh, the idea is to consider a system now in finite volume. So let's take a periodic system uh, in finite, oh, sorry, in, in, a, in, a, in a finite cylinder. Okay, so the system has uh, two boundaries. Here I'm considering the boundaries to be the same. Uh, and uh, basically to define the G function, we uh, <coughs> look, for example, at the closed string channel. So meaning that uh, the periodic direction uh, is associated to space. So we comprise uh, the theory with periodic boundary conditions. So that's why we call it the string channel and time is in the other direction, the length of the cylinder. <coughs> and again, if you define the partition function, you just insert the complete basis of states here in, in, in between and you sum over closed string states and uh, due to the fact that uh, there is some boundaries you have to also consider the overlap between uh, these both states and the boundary state itself properly uh, <clears throat> now the idea is to take the limit where this length becomes very large so that you project uh, these closed string states on, on, on the ground state and uh, so that's the usual answer but now there's a prefactor <coughs> which is related to these overlaps, and this allows us to define the G function as the overlap between a bulk ground state and a boundary state properly normalized. So that's, that's it, that's the definition of the G function. So this is and, just basically the tension of the B brain? Um, so the tension of the B brain. So, um, <clears throat> well, I, I don't know if you can, associated to the tension of the B-brain, but usually that's um, related to the entropy associated to the boundary. Uh, I don't know if you can translate that to, to the tension of the B-brain. Uh, maybe. I'm not sure. What is uh, omega? Is it the ground state of the theory? It's the ground state of the theory. I see. Uh, so, so no, I guess the tension would be some trace of the graviton instead. So it would depend a little on whether the graviton is one of your ground states or not. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, so uh, often this is called also ground state degeneracy and boundary entropy. And uh, essentially because if you compute the free energy uh, of the system, there will be a quantity that, or there will be a piece that is associated to the to the boundary and that's captured by the G function. So basically the G function uh, is an interesting quantity because it contains some universal information about the system. Uh, for example, it is under the RG flow, it's known to be monotonically decreasing from the UV to the IR. Uh, and so this is a sort of a universal property and that's why we, we often, uh, that's why it's an interesting quantity. So now let me just, uh, briefly mentioned one, one caveat here, you might complain that this G function as it is defined here uh, looks a little bit ambiguous because I'm not specifying the, the, the norm of this boundary state, neither the phase of this boundary state. Uh, and usually that's uh, fixed by imposing that the closed string channel and the open string channel are the same. So that fixes the norm of uh, the boundary state but there's still a phase that you can adjust. You can change this boundary state by a phase that wouldn't affect anything. Uh, and usually the definition is such that uh, we define this phase such that this G function is really impossible. Now in integrability- Sorry, but I think I just, just to add, I uh, was just thinking a bit more, but I think it will be related to the tension because basically there is some normalization that you have to introduce for the boundary state and this is in effect calculating that. Uh, and so then the, the graviton will be some correction, there will be some uh, momenta and things that go with it, but uh, uh, presumably there will be, it'll be some related quantity. Okay. okay. Um, and so, yeah, so as I was saying, this uh, G function provided you uh, equate both closed and, and open string channel that, that fixes uh, the norm of this boundary state. Uh, 
so let me do that and let me equate closed string channel with open string channel. Now the open string channel is you just quantize the theory on with open boundary conditions and you're evolving in periodic time. Uh, so now the partition function will be a sum of open those open string states. And uh, uh, then by equating the two and taking this large R limit, uh, I see that I can uh, compute the G function by studying the thermal partition function at infinite volume, but at finite temperature. Okay, so basically this is it. That's the definition of the, the G function. And so the outline for, for the rest of the talk will be to tell you first how do we uh, compute what is the standard routine to compute this tree function. And uh, uh, the answer will be that this tree function is given in terms of some sort of Fredholm determinant uh, uh, that comes out of the TBA, of the standard analysis of TBA. Uh, and then in the second part, I will uh, talk about the main uh, topic of the, of the work, which is to derive a new type of thermodynamic that which we call Tracy with and TBA, that is absolutely clear. Uh, and we did this for the simplest uh, integrable field theory, the same Jordan, but uh, just uh, go a little bit beyond that. Uh, then, I could I ask uh, how did it uh, relate uh, to the work of uh, Smirnov? He, he was also having some integral equation for some one point function. Yeah, I, I will. Comment on, on something uh, to that. Um, I will comment on that. Uh, so um, then I will take some some uh, physical checks of this proposal and we'll study the UV limit and the UV limit since will be related to a UV field and particular the G function will be related to the so-called FCZT states. Uh, and then I will in the last part I will make some comments about. Uh, Separation of variables, some observations that we have made, and, and some output. Okay, so uh, let me do a little bit of a historical recap of uh, the uh, story of this problem. It has been a long standing problem in integrable field theories. Uh, and it started, uh, the first attempt to, to, to compute was in the paper of the Claire Monsardo, Sala, and Scotty, MT5, where they uh, made a simple generalization of the TBA for, for this quantity. Uh, but then almost 10 years after, in 2004, there was a paper by Voinarovich which pointed out that uh, the previous result was incomplete and proposed some modification. Around the same year, there was a group uh, by Dori, Fioravanti, Rim, and Tadeo. By the way, this group has a lot of interesting work about that, uh, this problem even before 2004, but in 2004, they uh, studied the, the massive quantum field theories and uh, uh, for these massive quantum field theories they proposed uh, yet another modification with respect to the previous two attempts and only in 2010 uh, <coughs> this previous uh, approach was uh, derived in a sort of rigorous way and, and it was confirmed uh, and uh, the dust only settled I would say that in in 2018, with a paper by Kostov, Serban, and their student Wu, uh, which, uh, yet by another means, they were able to rigorously redirect the previous result. And uh, even in 2019, uh, later, uh, Ivan uh, did this previous result by a more elegant method, which involved some sort of effective quantum field theory with a path integral that can, could be localized. And uh, last year, uh, there was a paper by uh, Gian Komatsu and Vescovi, uh, which among many things, they also uh, redirived this previous result in a completely, in, well, in a, in a different way. Uh, so what's the naive approach or what, 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 what is the uh, strategy to, to determine this thermal partition function? So the idea is the following. So let's look at the open string channel and let's consider the simplest case where we have just a massive relativistic theory with one type of particle. So we have the usual relativistic dispersion relation. The mass M is the mass of the particle. And uh, well, we do the periodic uh, that type of equation, which is uh, you just start with the particle, you follow the particle, it will scatter off the boundaries, also scatter with other particles in between and come back to the same point. 
And so there is the propagation, which is now of size 2r, so the particle travels uh, twice times r. Uh, uh, there will be some scattering with n particles, and then there will be the uh, factors here. Uh, and I'm considering, without loss of generality, u to be positive. Uh, Sorry, so, uh, uh, what yeah. is R A and R B, like the A and B? What are... Oh, so sorry. Yeah, so these are uh, labels that are associated to the boundary. So typically, the boundary will depend on some parameters. Okay, it's like a, a mm -hmm. collective index that uh, parameterizes oh. all. Of so, in particular, you could put A equal to B. So, if in case of two boundaries to be the same. Oh. Uh, uh, so now we can just formally re excuse me. So, but uh, originally you have um, some state bound state uh, boundary state B, yes. So, and uh, this uh, reflection matrix somehow can be read from this uh, boundary state. Absolutely. So, so uh, the boundary state appears when you look at the closed string channel. So, when you rotate this picture and you start evolving from some boundary state and you evolve the system, and indeed. Uh, the two are related and in fact, basically by some sort of crossing symmetry relation or sort of crossing relation, uh, you can, can indeed relate to this reflection matrix with the boundary state. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, this is, this is of course very well known from the work of Zama Lotchikov and Goshal back in 93, I guess. So this is of course uh, very much standard material, but, uh, but it, it's true. I'm not gonna specify that, I will, will do reflection matrices. In, in fact, I will not uh, deal a lot with, with this relation between reflection matrices and, and boundary state, but that's uh, very well. Known. So uh, let me formally rewrite these equations uh, in a way that looks like a uh, closed, closed uh, type of synthetic bad ansatz. You just uh, rewrite these equations in a way that you now are dealing with uh, instead of n particles, you are dealing with two n particles, provided you make this uh, identification. And now you have this equation that up to this factor, they pretty much look like uh, closed uh, type of bad ansatz equations. Now, uh, the strategy is to start from these equations and uh, consider the thermodynamic limit. And uh, the idea is the standard, you define the densities of particles, you define densities of occupied states, densities of holes, and well, by taking the log derivative of these equations, you can define it in the standard way, except that now you have this additional factor. But other than that, it looks very much familiar, where this additional factor, eta AB, is related to these reflection matrices. And also I put here the delta function uh, because uh, I want to subtract uh, the state for which all rapidities are zero, which is, of course, a compatible, uh, well, it's a solution of these, these equations, but that's not the physical solution, so I have to subtract it. Uh, now, I can just apply the standard TBA routine, meaning computing the free energy, uh, first of all, the entropy associated to this state, uh, computing the, the free energy, and, of course, computing function which will look like a closed partition function uh, except that now there is this term and the, the saddle point equations are the same so are the same as, as, as the ones from a closed stream uh, or a closed system so one important aspect here is that this factor is r independent okay nothing here depends on on, on the volume of the system so uh, just going back to the equation where I uh, equate the closed string and open channel, and remembering that the G function uh, picks uh, the R independent part of the partition function, then it's a simple matter to equate this G with precisely, well, with this factor here. Um, and, well, and that, that's it. So this was the original proposal by Leclerc, Moussard, Dussel, and Skorik. Uh, but uh, there are a couple of caveats here. One caveat is that by doing so, we approximated this sum over open string states to an integral 
we replace the open this sum to an integral over the repeatedness. So that's usually what we do in thermodynamic side. So this R delta U to O uh, counts essentially the number of states that exist between U and U plus delta U. So usually we do this routine because, or do this replacement, just because uh, even if this relation is not exact, if there is like a, a prefactor here, uh, as long as it does not scale with R, it will not affect the saddle point, and therefore the saddle point will be uh, not modified. But of course here, this, if some coefficient here, that will be of course important because we are looking at order one quantities, okay? The other problem is that completely neglected fluctuations around the saddle point. So when we compute the thermodynamic path ansatz, we look at the saddle point, but we expect that will be, there will be quadratic fluctuations, and we just ignore that. So we have to take in, that into account. And those were uh, essentially the two points that were missing in the original analysis with Ernie Sardo and Salah and Skorik that were later uh, fixed. Uh, so, uh, let me uh, say the first point. So this replacement of a sum over open string states to integral over density that is missing by a factor of n, which, which can be easily understood where, where, what's the origin of this n. So basically, when I say we sum over open string states, what I really mean is we are summing over mode numbers that appear when I take the log of the bad equations. So that's the honest uh, sum over all configurations of the system. Now, to replace sum over mode numbers to integral over rapidities, uh, that usually involves a, a, a Jacobian. So that's a, that's a transformation from mode numbers to rapidities that usually involves this, uh, essentially it's the Godin norm. And if you work out a little bit more, you can show that this uh, can be written as a determinant, actually a Fredholm determinant of some operator that I would show. So that's, that's basically the conversion between mode numbers and rapidities. And on top of that, there is also the quadratic fluctuations around the saddle point, which uh, as good quadratic fluctuations, they come in a form of a determinant. It also can be written as a Fredholm determinant of another operator. And this was the, the, uh, derived by von in 2004. So if I take into account these two factors, then the G function is defined as the previous factor plus this correction, which is the Fredholm determinant, okay. this ratio of Fredholm determinants. Where, uh, just for completeness, let me show you what are these operators, G. So G is related to uh, Ks, and Ks is the standard kernel that appears in the TBA, so it's the log derivative of Ks matrix, dressed by something that depends on the y function. This is the y function, or the inverse of the y function. Uh, J plus, it's roughly the same, but it's now a symmet uh, uh, this combination of the, the log derivatives of this matrix, again, dressed by the same one function. So how do we, in practice, compute these uh, Fredholm determinants? Well, uh, we can do several things. One thing is to uh, approximate these functions or these matrices by, by some finite dimensional matrices and compute the determinant in the usual way. That might be good for some problems, not as good for, for other problems. Uh, the other approach is to uh, really expand this in a series. So, uh, the relation of log determinant to, to be related with trace of log and expanding in powers of G. And uh, if we do so uh, by uh, doing this trick or doing this expansion for this ratio, one can rewrite, one can combine the different terms and uh, uh, write as a series in the kernel Ks. Okay. Remember that case kernel KS is the standard kernel in the TBA. Uh, and also with this uh, prefactor depending on the functions. So this is fine for some practical purposes, but it's, it's not uh, very super efficient because you have to deal with these uh, 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 nested integrals here. Okay. Uh, sometimes you can truncate and truncate to few terms. It will give you a good approximation, but that's that's not what we want. Like to have to compute uh, multiple integrals, we know from many many other contexts where this this usually is a tricky a tricky thing to do. So uh, it's probably uh, the same integrals you get in this form factor business. 
Right, right. It's it's of the same complexity. Are they complex, but are they like are there more similarities? Uh, well, I would say that it's not. Uh, those are well. This is not. I, I think it's 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 not exactly the same, but uh, uh, the type of ingredients that appear in one and the other. Uh, are basically the same. So I would say that uh, I, I don't know how to pinpoint and precisely say that, well, this is this can be rewritten as the integrals of the form factors, but I think of in terms of complexity, it's, it's the same. That's the best I can, I can say. Uh, I don't know precisely if it's, it's, it's the same. It's not the same, but um, it's very much related. Uh, so the situation gets worse if we consider, for example, systems that have nesting that has been considered uh, in these three papers, at least. Uh, because now the kernels become, well, you have several kernels, now the uh, situation becomes much, com much more complicated. Uh, also, if you deal with excited states, you have to slightly modify uh, these expressions. And uh, uh, of course, there is the, uh, the case of uh, n equal to four, and this was actually the, the, the biggest motivation for this work, uh, was this uh, result by Gianco, Matsu, and Pescovi that computed three-point functions involving giant gravitons and single trace non dps states in planar n equal to four, and they show that this uh, can be expressed as a, a G function. And the G function in that case, while well, involves nesting, excited states involves every, uh, every sort of complication, particularly involves the kernels that appear in the TBA for, for the spectrum problem. So that case is much, much harder. And in fact, computing these Fredholm determinants, it's, it's really hard. So that's why we, we had the goal of trying to derive some TBA that would compute directly this uh, Fredholm determinants and it would be a more efficient and more transparent way of, of dealing with this. Okay. So, uh, are there any questions so far? Okay. So by TBA, what, what's your goal? Just to have one integral equation which you can iterate like five times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, it's uh, precisely that's, that's the uh, a functional equation of TBA type. It's an integral equation that I can iterate and Systematic. So here you have a very complicated sum and integral, but in principle you know everything that enters in it, right? If, if you're happy with doing some brute force um, numerics, then that mm -hmm. is, you, you can do it. Sure. But so so you, you trade no, knowing exactly sort of the things that enter for basically having a much simpler equation to compute. Right, 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 right. So in principle, this is, as you said, it's perfectly can compute this for any integral of field theory. Uh, it is normally convergent series, yes. Yes, yes. yes. So that, well, it, it depends if, on, the, on the kernel, but, but yes. Uh, may, may I ask you something? So if yeah. I, just to check if I've understood well. So you want to, you are saying that uh, it's better for you to compute uh, uh, some TBA equations, uh, to, to, to solve some TBA equation instead of uh, those Fredholm determinants. Am I right? Yes. I mean, in, in some cases, there might not be numerical gain. You know, in some cases, this is good enough if you truncate uh, for a few number of terms. And most of the cases, most of simple models, you can just truncate this sum to a few uh, cases, to a few, a few number of terms, and that's good enough. But if you, if you want to have more, uh, you know, a more general uh, or a more efficient framework that can be applied for many, uh, this, in particular, these complicated cases. Usually, functional equations are better than multiple integrals. So could I ask uh, so another question? So uh, you can also step uh, backwards and go to this uh, thermodynamic uh, definition, right? Uh, did some, someone try to just uh, kind of uh, take a few states with Bitanzas and more, like, Compute it to the minus energy and sum them together. Just like brute force calculation of the partition function. Oh, the I, boundary divided by without boundary. Because it doesn't look now more complicated than this uh, infinite number of integrals, right? 
Oh, I, I, th I think that's that's roughly. If you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's roughly what uh, uh, David Ferravan and company did. Roughly speaking, is is that right, David? Yes, yes, yes. Correct. I think uh, unfortunately the, the connection is not so so good. But if uh, if um, Kolya can repeat his question, I think uh, that the answer is uh, is, is yes. <laughs> yeah. We computed the, the right hand side. So let's take that bit on that, like let's not do any fancy TDA, whatever, we don't uh, care about Y function, all this uh, stuff, let's forget about it. Just a brute force calculation of partition function, uh, we only know bit on that, compute energies with boundary, without boundary, boundary, divide one by another. Yes, 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 of course, of course there are some useful subtleties because this as uh, you all said, these are all, all one terms. So it's uh, it it works if you are very careful and you get exactly. The Sorry, I, I I muted myself. So you get exactly the right hand side of the of the main expression you see over there. Mm. Doing that, you get exactly the right hand side. You see, you see the the the, the plus and the minus, no. So and, but anyhow, it's 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 there are subtleties that is uh, we we pointed out about the the Jacobian and you have to collect all the terms. In fact, honestly, in my perspective, it, it was pretty much. Uh, proof because we were not missing anything but right right you know, your result was completely correct yeah. your result we was not, because the point was that uh, Vojanovic was not complete he was missing something right, but right. there is that there is Roberto that is here so he can he can correct ah, okay but my question was for numerical purposes can you just like uh, Monte Carlo beat on that and uh... uh, I'm sure you can but the question is what, what's more efficient yeah, that's exactly what I was asking. Yeah, this is this, uh, until you do it. I, I, if, if I've understood correctly, apparently, but let me understand if I've understood. So although Fredon determinant basically, basically corresponds naively to me, uh, I'm very simple minded uh, numerically, corresponds to a linear equation, you prefer somehow to solve a linear equation and than a, a linear equation. Is that right? Because numerically it's more efficient. Because well, we are, you are going to propose us the, the, the polymer TBA as far as sort of, right? yeah. yes, yes, which are two, 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 equa two equations, no, two pseudo energies, as far as I remember. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, I just don't like. Well, it's not that I just don't like, but I, I think that that uh, well, there is the problem with with computing these nested integrals. That's one, one thing that if you go to very high order, that's not really efficient. But I also, I, I'm looking for generalizations. I want to have a machine that I can, for example, apply to n equal to four to have some functional equations. Uh, so perhaps having some functional equations will perhaps be easier to solve, for example, in some limits, some UV limits, for example, uh, or around some UV limits analytically, I think that offers more possibilities than, than having this series representation. That, uh, it's good for numerical purposes, but it's not very transparent. But Joao, I have another question about numeric. So what about if you don't expand the determinant in this way, but you just discretize the operator one minus you, you can You can also and do And then that. you try, just compute the determinant. That's also, that's also possible. Does that work? This that that looks like it would be more efficient than Perhaps that, that's, that's more efficient. Again, I think that even if you put the three possibilities side by side for uh, you know, discretizing, expanding series, or using this TPA, in simpler cases, I would say that the gain is not, is not big. But uh, I think that uh, if you go for more complicated cases, then I think it's easier to implement some functional equations than, than computing this instead. But again, our our to be to, to come with some something which was numerically more efficient. Okay, so uh, so let me uh, review a little bit this relation between Fredel determinants and TBA. So that that has been uh, known for a while. Um, so uh, the first instance where this relation 
appeared was in the paper that appeared in 92 by Chakotti, Fendley, uh, Interligator, and Vafa, where they computed uh, some super symmetric index in two dimensions. Uh, although they didn't uh, write it as a Fredholm determinant, it, it, it can be written as a Fredholm determinant, and they observed that was the first instance where they observed that that quantity could be computed by some uh, functional equation of the thermodynamic that ends at type. Uh, then there was an uh, upgrade on this proposal by Samuelchikov, which uh, applied this to this famous paper of Polymer. Uh, and uh, it generalizes a little bit the, the previous work. Uh, but these relations were only proven rigorously by Tracy Williams in 94. And actually, this is the reason why we call it uh, the Tracy Williams TPA, just to distinguish as the usual TPA. So we had to come up with a different name. Uh, and uh, more recently, that has been extensively used, for example, in the context of partition function and supersymmetric gauge theories. And this works by uh, Calvo, Gracia, Tsuga, Marino, Moriani, and and others. Um, uh, and so the, the, the idea is to deal with a two layered system, in fact. So, uh, we first solve the usual TBA, which has, which is sourced by the dispersion relations, so provided you give the mass of, of you, you can uh, iterate the TBA and get the Y function out of it. And then the Y function will so serve as a source for this Tracy with TBA. So that's roughly the logic to get, uh, finally, to get G. Okay, uh, so we're gonna consider the simplest possible example uh, the example of the Singevorgan, which is uh, perhaps the best well-known uh, integral of field theory, uh, which consists of a single type of particle of mass m. Uh, the Lagrangian is defined in this way. Here there is a particle constant, which is related to the mass, and there is the, the coupling B here. Uh, the S matrix is fully well-known. It's in full generality. It uh, depends on uh, uh, coupling constant by this factor P here. Uh, and we're going to consider even a, a, a simplification where we'll set uh, B equal to 1. So we'll set, we'll go to the deep quantum regime of Sinsch-Gordon, where uh, the, the, the reason for that is, is that the kernel simplifies simply as a cosh, 1 over cosh, without, without shifts. Okay. So that's the only reason. Mm -hmm. Can I ask? Uh... How do you get this kernel? I mean, in this case, it was known, certainly, but uh, in principle, how would you go about to find the kernel? So the, you have to, well, once you have the S matrix, so I'm assuming that you know the S matrix of the system. And then you take the log derivative. Sorry, but this is the, uh, isn't this kernel the one that has to do with the boundary? Is, no. no, no, no. Ah, no, sorry. sorry. No. I, I, I got confused. Sorry. Uh, no, so this, um, the boundary, so, it, yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, basically the G function, I'm computing, so the, the, the boundary information sits here in this prefactor. Uh, what I'm computing is something that is independent of the boundary. Is this uh, ratio of determinants? So this this you can compute uh, straightforwardly just by if, if you know the R matrices uh, and the Y function, you iterate the TBA. This is you don't need anything to compute this. This is as good as, as computing the energy of the system. Uh, but now I'm dealing with this part which doesn't know about the, the R matrix. So this is sort of an yeah. universal piece. Sorry, that I depends on. Uh, yeah, I missed this important point. Thank you. Okay, so that, that, that piece just depends on the bulk data. Uh, and so uh, we also consider uh, the boundary singe Gordon. Uh, so in the open string formulation that is given by the standard bulk Lagrangian plus additional boundary terms, which depend on generally two parameters, uh, boundary cosmological constant, and also this shift here. And for both, for any value of these parameters, this particular deformation is integral, as shown originally by Samoschikov and Gosha. Uh, and uh, so uh, you have, a, and, and the reflection matrices are known. So this is an example where you can compute everything by brute force. Okay? But we want to study uh, 
the this kernel is particularly simple to see if we can formulate some TBA. Okay, so uh, the just a moment, just a moment. Before you say that it is a very well known thing how to relate uh, uh, boundary state to the reflection matrix. Okay. Yes, and uh, here it seems so that you have uh, how many one two parameters uh, to parameterize this boundary effect. Yes, so so somehow boundary wave function parameterized by two parameters. Yes. And the, and, and the reflection matrix also depends on these two parameters. Or, well, it's, it's a function of these two parameters. It's a non trivial function. Uh, general boundary wave function. Well, the, the, you see, the classical boundary wave function. But it's not general boundary wave function. Yeah, but general wave function. Well, no one well, discusses I mean, general. There's a very particular types of integrable boundary. Yes, the, right. and this is the question. Is it true that general boundary wave function corresponds to particular reflection matrix. No. What do you mean by general boundary? I mean, the, the classical wave function is given literally by the exponential of this term. So the, if you exponentiate, this is the classical uh, boundary wave function. Mm -hmm. So, so for the X, the very you have a reflection of boundary. Now, really. Yeah. So the, the boundary is this one that I'm considering. So if you put the uh, other thing, it might not be integrable. It might break, in break into variability. So I'm, I'm dealing with this particular type. When I call it boundary singe Gordon, I, I mean this specific boundary, which is not. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can have a boundary state which creates particles, which will obviously be a bit uh, not right. from integrability right. point of view. Right. So it's, it's not true that, I mean, an integrable, even a free theory, if you add a, a boundary term, it, it might not be integrable. It's not. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. So I'm uh, the derivation that I'm going to use, which is uh, strongly inspired by the Tracy Whedon derivation. In principle, valid for uh, kernels which are symmetric on the variables U and B and have this particular form here for any reasonable function E and M. And by reasonable, I mean here that uh, we'll have to go case by case, but uh, I believe that generally if you deal with uh, functions that do not have singularities uh, on the real line, uh, that might be good. But I don't, I, I don't know specifically what conditions uh, are necessary so that the whole derivation until the end uh, goes through. Even if it, it's, it's uh, not, if it if it's just uh, like some weird functions here, the derivation will go through up to some point at least. Okay. So, does this include all the difference form uh, kernels or? Mm, no. Not necessarily. Not, not, right? not, no, not necessarily. So here the generalization. So the the original kernel one over cos of u minus v has been done already by Tracy Whitham. So our addition was to deal with a kernel that uh, involves the sum of probabilities because those will be important uh, for the G function. We also deal with one over cos of u plus v. Uh, and that, it looks like an innocent change, but actually it, 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 uh, it has some, some significant effect. Uh, but I believe that uh, this includes a large class of kernels, but unfortunately, it doesn't include many kernels that are interesting in integrable models, many kernels of difference form. Uh, so why, uh, how can I bring the kernels like one over cos of u minus v or one over cos of u plus v? How, how can I bring that to this form? So, uh, uh, so the idea is the following. So let's uh, expand this determinant. Let's uh, stick for now with uh, the kernel G. The kernel G plus uh, is, is exactly the same. So let's use this formula and expand this in series, just this first piece. This is what I did before, but now let me just focus on a single Fedon determinant. So if you use uh, exponential of trace of log and then you expand the log of one plus G uh, and here I'm introducing a bookkeeping parameter Z that uh, in the end I can set it to one. So I expand in, in power series in Z. Uh, so this is the definition of the kernel of G, uh, which I can rewrite in terms of a new kernel, uh, which is defined in this way. Okay, so I just 
include some dependence of the y function in the kernel itself. And this is the definition of this kernel KS. So written in this form, uh, I can, uh, it's immediate to see that this kernel actually is of this type if I define EU and NU in this way. So for this step, it's essential that you, this parameter, whatever it was, to zero, or I don't remember, to get uh, one over course, right? Sorry? So before you, you pick some particular parameter, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you don't pick this parameter, you'll have cost of U minus V shifted. And that does not fall exactly on this type of kernel, but it will be like EU times MV and over MU plus MV, but in front of this MU and MV, there will be a coefficient there. And so you can generalize for that case as well, but we, we just didn't uh, pursue that because we thought that this is really the simplest case, but that can be generalized also for the cost that has a shift. But it requires still more work. Uh, uh, so for the case of K plus, uh, remember that K plus is basically the log of the S matrix with uh, uh, S of U minus V and S of U plus V. That also can be brought to this particular form. Uh, derivative of the log. Derivative of, 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 of the log, yes. Uh, that can also be brought to, the, to this form uh, just by redefining this E, U, and N, okay? So for the moment, uh, for most of what I'm gonna do, I will forget about the specific form of this E, U, and N, U. It will be later be important because uh, some of the analytic properties of the equations will come precisely from uh, the explicit expression of EU and MU, but for most of the part, uh, the derivation will, will be completely general. Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, Joel, sorry, just um, when you think it's a good uh, time to have a coffee break, uh, let us know, but it's up to you. Oh, uh, for me, I mean, if you think now it's the time, I mean, for me, I, I, I don't need coffee break, but... Uh, <laughs> but... I mean, it's up to you if, That's for us, if, if anyone wants, <laughs> if, if anyone uh, wants. We, we, nor wants we normally have it, yeah, around this time, but if you want to go on. Okay, we can, we can do a break or... now or okay. if, if you want. So how does it work now? We, we just. Uh... Um, if you want, you can stick around and there will be questions. Oh, okay, okay, I'll, I'll stick the, around. Yeah. So I will pause the recording. Okay. No. Okay. Okay, please, Joe, when, whenever you want. Okay. All right, so uh, as I was saying, so we are going to study the Sinch Uh And as I pointed out, uh, we are going to study this class of kernels. Uh, our kernels are in part a particular example of this class of kernels. And we are interested in computing essentially powers of the kernel. Okay, so we are interested in computing these things. So uh, how did I have this Tracy Williams? So I'll, I'll give the major steps and, and leave, of course, some details uh, outside, but I think um, with, with the steps that I'm gonna show here, you, you probably can complete the derivation. Uh, so uh, we are gonna start to derive some recursion relation for this power of K, okay? So how to do that? Um, Let's start by uh, uh, formally uh, regard this function EU as a sort of a wave function associated to this cat E. Okay, so this is just formally. I say that uh, this EU is just the cat E projected on the bra U. And in the same way, I will regard this M of U in a more operatorial sense by saying that this M of U is just the action of a certain operator on the cat U gives me this MU, okay? So just from this uh, formal definition, I can rewrite this kernel in terms of uh, this relation. So just to see that uh, this implies that is basically you just uh, in sandwich this with say U and V on the other side and that, that will give you that. So K at in sandwich between U and V is this kernel K U and V. Now, this is the uh, anti-commutator of k and m. So let's suppose now that I compute the uh, commutator of k squared with m. 
So if I do this, I can just add and subtract these pieces and use the previous relation here and here to show that uh, this commutator will be uh, just given by this and this already gives me a relation between k squared and k. Okay, so this is the type of things that I want to do. So you can apply this trick uh, for higher powers of n and one can convince oneself that uh, this following relation is true. So I, I'm computing the commutator on I'm decommutating depending on n, uh, and that relates a higher power of k, k to the n, to smaller powers of k. Okay. So that's, that's one relation. Now, once I have this relation, uh, I can ensandwich this on both sides by u and v. And uh, so you see, if I ensandwich here by u and v, then I get a relation for the kernel k to the n related to smaller powers of k to the l and k to the n minus l minus one. So these are some matrix elements. So these are some uh, scalar functions that I will call phi of l of u, phi n minus l of v. E. Okay. okay. So can, we, just can we look back at just the top reabsorb the derivation? Okay. Yeah, and then next, 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 next the whole slide. So, um, so you can, uh, now imagine you are computing m k to the three plus k to the three m, then you can just express that in terms of m k squared minus k squared m, which by itself can be written uh, in terms of this. this sorry, but what does k hat? So k hat is a kernel, it's, it's, sorry, it's an operator whose kernel is this. So if I... Uh, so it doesn't uh, act on this uh, funny space uh, u. It, it does. So if you in sandwich k hat on u and on v, you get k u v. Can you realize so, it in a more standard way, like actually integrating something over some mesh and maybe e will be some delta function, u will be some delta function and so on? To make it uh, less uh, abstract. Yeah, so to make you, it less uh, So we, you, we can think it's just delta function and E is... Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you can, sure. Um, yeah, yeah, you can, you can, you can, sure, sure. Uh, right, so if you it is project it... At some integral, of, it is actually some integral operator, all of them. Yes. Are, yeah, yeah, you can. You can just uh, like a coordinate uh, eigenfunction, delta function e x yeah. by integration. All the of them x by integration. So they all have yeah. the same space, and then you have this L two. Okay. Right. right. Um, so now you can, uh, as I said, so you can express this k to the power n in terms of these uh, functions phi l of u phi n minus l of e. Now, just from this definition here of phi L, you can read off this relation as well. So phi of j will be related to phi of j minus one, just pulling out one factor of k acting on, on, the, on the right. Okay. Uh, so this is should be clear from this definition. Wait, 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 this one. Phi of j. Ah, okay. So I just uh, write KL as yeah, equal KL minus one times K and I have to K on E and KL acting on E gives me this, this it's the action of this kernel. Yeah. Um, so this is already a recursion relation because now I uh, starting with this seed, I can just iterate uh, many times and, and get phi of J. And once I get phi of J or, or any phi of L or any but, uh, uh, powers of K. So there's not, not much gain on this, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a, an important thing that we can use. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so these two relations will be important. So starting from this relation here, we can yet derive another uh, relation, which is, is gonna be important. Uh, so again, this is the question that uh, we have. Remember that this K, is roughly one over cosh of u minus v or cosh of u plus v, depending on the cases. But let's let's imagine for the moment that this is like 
uh, 1 over cos of u minus v with some tracing here. Now I can use this relation of the cos of shifts. This is the standard relation that cos shifted up and down is related to the delta function. I can plug it here and I get uh, a relation of this type. The formula of the Russian scientist. Sorry? Called Sahotsky equation. Okay. Maybe he was. Uh, I, I think he might have been Polish, but uh, never mind. Yeah, Russian Empire. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, Okay, so, uh, so th then it, this is uh, trivial to get this relation. So f what appears here is not exactly phi, but it's phi dressed by some, some uh, additional functions. Okay, but this relation is true where now plus plus means a shift of i pi over two. So it's slightly different notation that uh, is often used in, in context of integrable models. Um, and now what I can do is sum over j on both sides, or z, z to the tray and, and, and sum on both sides. And that allows to get some relation uh, which is of the Baxter type. So here I'm splitting this sum into odd and even parts here, okay? And so uh, summing the even parts on the left hand side will be related with the odd parts on the right hand side and vice versa. So that's why I get a pair of equations, which is P plus plus, P minus minus equal to K roughly, where P is the sum. And these are related to the right function. So this looks a little bit like, smells like Baxter type of equations, at least formally. That's why I call it Baxter-like, but the uh, analogy is not more than just formally. Uh, and now, uh, once I have these functions p and q, what I can do is the following. So now I go back to the kernel that I want to compute. And uh, I split the kernel. Remember that I want to compute powers of the kernel. So I split these powers into about the previous odd step. parts and even parts. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So this uh, equation you wrote, so in principle, it's a uh, fourth order finite difference equation with four solutions. How do you it, it choose the right one? Well, probably. Uh, one, it, it, one, I, I, I will not have to solve it uh, exactly. This will be an auxiliary uh, equation for yet another equation. So I will not solve it exactly, but uh, but in principle, I mean, this is totally well defined because this comes from these phi's, and these phi's are perfectly well defined. It's not uh, so you can, uh, if you will manage is to solve. This function of z. So the shift is in z. No, I uh, know in u. In u. In u. And in z u. is like a parameter. Z is a parameter. So here it is. So in principle, I know what p is because I know all these functions phi. So. Mm -hmm. Joel and just uh, rewriting. Uh, okay. Joel, and do you uh, how do you exclude the periodic solutions here? Because periodic, I periodic solutions, as we say, uh, go through here. Yes. Uh, oh, but he has, he has an analogy on the control when z is small, at least, right? So yeah. you know something about analogy, yes? Yeah, I I know completely these functions. I know everything about this function ah. because I know this these pieces here. In fact, you have the solution. I have the solution, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I will conveniently split the kernel into odd powers and even powers. So you see that if I expand this uh, in Z, I will get odd powers of K, and here I will get even powers of K. Okay. Now, uh, The nice thing is that I can express this previous formula. I can express RO, which is the kernel of this guy, and RE, which is the kernel of this guy, in terms of Q and P, just by using the previous formula. It just follows from the definition. Okay. Now the goal will be to derive a closed system of equations for RO and RE, because that's what I want. Perhaps using Baxter 
uh, using the Baxter relation and these definitions, I might have to massage things in such a way of obtaining a closed system of equations only involving RO and RE. So that's the goal. So R and uh, actually they are functions of three variables, U, V, and Z. Yes, that's right. So here I'm, uh, there should be another variable C, but it's implicit. So this Z will be actually set to one in the end? In the end, in the end. So in the end, the logic will be that these arbitrary powers of the K, and, and then of course I can set uh, Z uh, to one because I, I'm just interested in the powers of K. Because once I know the powers of K, I can just uh, term the expansion of the thread on the term. So, um, so it turns out that uh, RO and RE themselves, they do not form a closed system of equations. I will have to introduce another auxiliary function, eta, which is uh, a definition of K, D, and uh, well, it also appears E. Now, uh, what turns out to be true is that this function, together with the other two functions that I defined before, and here uh, I, took the, I take the limit V uh, to one, because in the end I will have to compute the trace of the kernel, and the trace of the kernel amounts to certain variables uh, to be equal. So now it turns out that using these three definitions plus the Baxter like relations, one can in, find, in, in fact find a closed system of equations that involve only eta, RO, and RE. Okay? That will uh, involve some manipulation to eliminate Q and E from these equations. Uh, but what we get is the following. So let me show you the equations and then tell you that one can verify uh, using the definitions. So the derivation is a little bit technical in the sense that it requires some. Uh, creative manipulation of these functions, but uh, at the end of the day, we get uh, some sort of Y system for this Tracy Williams TBA. So uh, I'm not explaining you how, how to get here, but you can convince yourself that using the previous definitions for eta and RE and uh, using the Baxter like equations, one can show that these relations are true. These are just true, just using the definitions. Okay? So we get some sort of Y system equations uh, that have this uh, weird looking shape, but that's what it is. Uh, and now we need to invert this type of equation. So we need to uh, write this in terms of some integral equations. And for that, we need to know explicitly the forms of the kernel. So we, may, we need to specify uh, the analytic properties of them so that we can confidently do the Fourier transform and, and do the shifts in the usual way. So if we do so, uh, so this is the example for KS, for K plus, we have another type of, of equations uh, that look very similar, but they are slightly different because the kernels are different. Okay, so uh, inverting these equations is straightforward by uh, Fourier transform, and what we get is uh, precisely the Tracy Wigan TBA. So for example, for Ks, uh, this equation is, looks very good, and we can invert this equation if everything is well behaved. We can invert this equation with a Cauch kernel, so that's why we get this equation here. Could you remind how the final answer is extracted from here? It's just some integral of our. I, 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 I will. I will tell. I will tell in a moment. Uh, just wait until the next slide, and, and I will tell. You. Uh, so these are uh, the equations, and it's, it's straightforward to solve them. Uh, for K plus, given that the analytics are slightly different, there is some variation of the equations. So there's in particular some principal value, there is some, some minor changes, but they, they, they are different because the kernels are, are different. So this is really the, the new uh, to Tracy Williams. So this derivation follows, it is like, a, uh, very close to the Tracy Widham derivation with some changes, uh, and it's adapted to, to our problem. Um, but uh, so these are the two uh, equations that uh, we obtain. Now, how to solve this TBA? Well, it's straightforward. 
we're just expanding z all quantities we uh, re solve it uh, iteratively so for example uh, the first step is given by the y function so if you give me the y function i can compute the first power of r e once i have r e i plug it here and i can get uh, the leading power of eta once I have eta, I can compute the leading power of RO. And then plug it here again and solve for the next power of RE. So I can uh, follow this, this logic and that you can go up to order that you, that you like. Okay. Now, once I have this... Uh, so you had already this equation for this phi j, right? Which was kind of yes. the same already, right? Yes. So why, why do we need to, to rewrite it in this more TBA-like form? Uh, from usability perspective, they're equivalent, more or less, right? They are more or less equivalent, yes. Yes, they are more or less equivalent, but... Uh, um, yeah, uh, in terms of gain, uh, well, using that, using that recursion of fine j, that is mostly equivalent to the series expansion of the of the, the, the of the Fred on the term. That's no well but there are there you're kind of acting by the operator on a state, right? So each time you compute you iterate one integral. You don't need to yeah. act from infinitely many states and then uh, right. compute the computer determinant. Right, right. right. The kind of eigenvalue which you compute in a sense. Right. Right. Uh, it it's true that I, I uh, perhaps there's not much gain uh, from that formulation to this formulation and Actually, we thought that for a long time that perhaps we, we, we could stop there, but uh, I think that uh, functional equations are more, um, well, it's, uh, if you want to generalize or understand some analytic properties or some study some limits, perhaps this is, this is better. But in terms of efficiency of the method, I, I, perhaps there is not much gain in this formulation. Uh, but that, this has also the advantage that directly computes the power of, of k. Right? There you would have to compute one phi or several phi's, put them together, integrate, and then get the get, uh, power of k. Here you solve directly for powers of k. Um, uh, well, actually in your yes. equations I do not see z at all. Sorry? And, and I know that z was a, like zero like for power series before, but in your equation, since there's this blue box, there are no, there is no z. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's this. This is implicit here. No, but okay. It's implicit inside of all of, of R and theta, but the equations themselves do not have z. So I'm kind of confused. Which equations? In blue box. Yes, these are in functions the, of z. Uh, yeah, but I mean, suppose I never knew that z existed. I mean. So for any any for any z you get some solution to this equation. Yeah, yeah. I I could so solve. I could, not, so this equation has infinitely many solutions. In other words. Yes. Yes. So it's not That's like right. TBA where TBA is believed to have a discrete set of solutions. Right, but here what I so it's true that I can uh, fix a z and 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 compute. Uh, uh, and, and find the solution of these equations. But what I want is really to compute uh, powers of this kernel. So I expand in Z and that will unambiguously extract me these powers of K. Uh, no, yeah, but I mean, so there is a big difference with usual TBA uh, again. So in TBA, you just have equation, you solve it, there is one, well, maybe two yes. solutions, and uh, you, that gives you the physical quantity. If you give me the uh, blue box, I won't be able to to proceed just with it, right? because it will have. But also for iterations, normally it's a problem when there is a zero mode, uh, because this affects convergence. Right. Know. So, so but, but let me tell you that there, there's also another difference with respect to TBA is that here, it's not that you iterate until you get some convergence. Uh, here, like here, at each order, you solve exactly for, for, for the quantity. Yeah, which was also the case for phi i, right? At least in order, phi the first power in z. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, that's right. But uh, so I, I'm just pointing out that I call it this TBA, but there is significant differences, and that's one of them. That at each order in the expansion in z, this, this is exact. It's not that you have to iterate until you reach some convergence. Uh, and 
uh, and basically that that's it. So once I uh, find this uh, R U, um, I try the powers of K, and that, that solves the problem because I can just sum them uh, and and obtain the expansion of the fat on the top. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see, that's the the the, the main result of, of this part. Uh, of course, we tested against brute force by computing these integrals uh, numerically. Now, of course, that, that works very well. And I think here it's clear that it's straightforward to um, uh, uh, go to arbitrary high powers in K. Whereas in this integral representation, well, it's, it's harder to go to, to higher powers of K. But here, it's just uh, iterating more, and uh, that's, that's uh, very simple to do. So, we could produce very, very good results numerically without much effort, just implementing this with, say, fast Fourier transform. And so, without any sophisticated methods, we could get very good results. So I'm a bit uh, confused still. Um, so you have, like from the linear algebra perspective, what would be the analog of this procedure? Because, I mean, if you want to compute determinant, you need to apply to your basis, expand in the basis, compute, uh, 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 determinant of the metric, right? So now it seems like you only apply to one vector and be happy with that. But even if it was eigenvector, you still need to do it infinitely many times. Am I missing one parameter somewhere? Or? Sorry, you. Huh? It's a bit like you take determinant of one plus z a. Then you expand in Z, and then you write it always uh, log of trace also. Yes. This yeah, kind of stuff. For the trace, you still need to sum over uh, n states, right? So what, wh 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 where? So where you just take integral du, right? That's uh, taking the trace. Ah, uh, du. Apparently. All right, so, so you have, so kind of compute trace. Uh, so the final answer would be what the sum of all this trace k to power n uh, times z n. Yes. So so so. Um, so how how is it then different if I just indeed just take whatever so, of any form I have, and then compute so integral multiple integrals right? Uh, so I I fix u, right? Then I compute integral, and then yeah, I set the last argument to you and then integrate in you. Mm -hmm. So it's still like I generate phi i analog of your phi i, which will depend on you. Yes. And then at the end I integrate in you. So even yes. if it was not of this form, I can still kind of get this process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If uh, that, that, if you, that's absolutely true. So this, this thing here, this relation here. Yeah. Uh, I think this is totally general for Regardless of, of you know the analytic properties of the kernel, and I think this is totally general. Yeah, yeah the, even if it was in, not, not in this form of e, e and mu m, right? Uh, it's not exactly this relation, relation, but I can, I can still define. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. I can define phi i of u. Uh, as a bracket between u of k to the power j. Let it yes. be my phi i of, uh, of j, and that uh, as hard to compute as yours, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Then I have to do it for all u's and integrate. Yeah, yeah. So in a sense, where is the gain in, 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 in the trick? How, how, where do I gain? Uh, sorry, so, sorry, let me make some, one comment. So here, like, uh, we, are ju we just need to consider phi zero of u equals one. So that's particular, like a vector. But I think if what you are going to do, uh, so if, you, if we are going to do what you just suggested, then I think we need to consider like all possible phi zero of u. Because you want to take a functional trace. Uh, well, phi zero of u, well, functional trace, but the functional trace uh, acting on the eigenstates of u, so it will be at the end an integral in u. So phi, phi zero of u for me will be also one because I will define it as a bracket of k to zero between two u's. Right? 
well, that's probably you need to start with the delta function or something. No? Yeah, well, I, uh, yeah, at this level, I'm not able to distinguish one from delta function because. <laughs> okay. So you think there is what one uh, one less uh, complexity level or not? Yeah, I think there is one less. Because I'm a bit uh, confused. Okay. <laughs> but because what happened? What's the analog then? If there is one less complexity level, saying you don't need to compute trace in a sense, is it what you're saying? So you are not summing over n states in your trace. Why? The, why is that? Is it like you, you know that all all other, you would choose the basis in such a way that k to the n acts on them trivially, or? And only one state is important? Like, what's the analog of this in the linear algorithm in finite dimensional case? Yeah, I don't have a clear answer. I think, like, this depends on the structure of the kernel. Like yeah, so uh, it, can you construct a fine dimensional analog of the structure of the internet? Yeah. Then? That's an interesting question, but I don't have an answer. Maybe you yeah, all has. The matrix, which is almost degenerate, there's only one, no one eigenvalue and all other side one, and then you just compute y and an eigenvalue, that's your determinant. Is it true for this type of matrix? It seems like there is only one non trivial eigenvalue of, of k. Well, I'm not sure if that's true, but I cannot give you a clear answer. Because that's the only thing I can think of uh, which would reduce you from the duty to compute trace uh, in the true way, right? Because even if it's diagonal matrix, you still have n operations, and in this case, it will be infinite to many. So unless uh, all the like entropy sits in one eigenvalue, all the thing you want. Anyway, so let's maybe you you tell me later because I'm still confused about it. Okay. Um. Okay, so um, how much time do I have? Okay, so uh, so that's that. That's it. That's uh, well. Either well, this is a formulation of the problem uh, that allows you to to compute very easily, just without much effort to compute any arbitrary. Okay, uh, but now we'd like to to make some. Uh, more physical checks and, and, and see some relation, uh, some more physical interesting limits of, of uh, uh, the G function. And for that, we're gonna uh, study the CFT or UV limit of the Sinchardon, which is uh, well known to be related to the Liouville CFT. Uh, so the reason why this happens is of course well known, but uh, uh, let me review uh, uh, quickly. So we start with the open string Lagrangian uh, of the Sinchardon defined on a strip of size R. Uh, and uh, we add also uh, this boundary term. So what we're gonna do is to rescale the width of this strip to, to pi, uh, fix this to, to pi, and uh, if you look at the way this Cauch transforms under this rescaling, you'll get a factor of r to the two, r to the uh, two plus two b squared. Uh, and now I'm integrating over a strip plus two pi, and then if I take the UV limit, which is R going to zero, uh, I can neglect one of the exponentials and uh, take a configurational space limit where phi uh, is very large, scale, double scaling with R, in such a way that only one exponential survives, and in that case, you, you get precisely the boundary of the real theory. So if you now switch back to the closed string channel, you expect that uh, the G function in the UV should be related to the Viscon point function of the boundary of the field somehow. And this is what we want to, uh, clarify a little bit. Uh, so, uh, per, uh, classifying the states in Liouville and St. Jordan, it's, it's a well-known story. Uh, in the Liouville, uh, to simplify the discussion, we're gonna, considering, uh, gonna consider uh, the classical limit, uh, where we send b to zero, just to understand what is this. And consider a field configuration that is constant in the space. So this is what's called usually uh, the mini superspace approximation. And in that case, uh, all the states are specified by giving a value to the canonical momentum point you to find out. Now we can uh, uh, do the same for uh, the same type of 
approximation is municipal space approximation for the singe Horden. And we'll have the generalization of the momentum P, which will now be a function of the volume of the system, P of L. Okay, so here right now I'm in the closed uh, string channel. Uh, now, uh, if you take the UV, uh, basically the energy of uh, the ground state of the singe Horden, which sometimes is often written in terms of the effective central charge, uh, acquires the CFT behavior where the central charge approaches the Liouville central charge, which is minus uh, one minus 40 squared. So uh, when we are not sitting at the CFT point, but they are very close to it, we'll take uh, the same approximation, saying that the uh, uh, effective central charge will be one minus 24 T of L squared. Uh, there will be corrections to this relation, but uh, uh, this relation has been used uh, before and with, with success, so we, we, we take it as a way of defining P of L in terms of uh, effective central charge, very close to the UV. Now, uh, Ajal, uh, sorry, can you try to finish in 10, 15 minutes? Uh, uh, I, I, can, I can rush. And yeah. then, okay, okay, thanks. But uh, then we can have some discussion later. So okay, let me uh, go then uh, quickly here. Thank you. So it is, uh, uh, mini superspace approximation, the ground state uh, will satisfy some Schrodinger equation. The, that's the Schrodinger equation that you get from the, the annual formula of the theory in this limit. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the potential is Koch, which is the, the potential of the singe Harden. Uh, and this equation is the so-called Mathieu equation. So it, it, it's completely solvable. Uh, but we're not going to solve it exactly. We're going to just uh, have a feeling of the physical problem. Uh, so basically, you have this potential. Uh, and uh, essentially, in this region, this blue region, where you're far away from the left wall, basically, the, the, the wave function is well approximated by the Liouville wave function, which is well known to be given in terms of a Bessel k. Uh, also, if you go now to this uh, red region where the right wall is very far away, you can also get the mirror wave function. And then imposing that the two are compatible in the central region, you get that the momentum is actually quantized. Where here S is the classical reflection matrix, uh, which can be obtained by taking the wave functions in this region. So this is a quantization condition which, which uh, can, can be used to relate P and L alternatively to the previous relation where uh, it was related through the central charge. So now, uh, if we try to solve this equation, uh, you see that for L to be very small, P also decays, so that we get to the conclusion that the ground state of the singe Gordon in the CFT limit corresponds to a Liouville state with the equal to zero state. Okay, so that's what we have to uh, consider. Now, uh, the Liouville boundary data is very well known. Those are the so-called, uh, well, it has been bootstrapped by Fatev, Zamalachikov, in a different way but by Teshner. Uh, and in that case, the uh, one-point function, the disk-one-point function, is uh, given by this uh, expression, which is exact. It, it has been bootstrapped, so it's valid for any value of B. Uh, and, and S here is a parameter associated to the boundary, so related to the uh, cosmological boundary constant. Uh, and uh, now, as I said before, we have to look at the case where P equal to zero to match with Sinch Gordon, but there is a pole at P equal to zero, which is just uh, the standard IR singularity due to the fact that the potential in the field is not bounded. So you have to somehow subtract this pole. Uh, and to do that, uh, we uh, go back to the classical limit where this one point function in the Sinch Gordon is interpreted as the overlap between a bulk wave function and the boundary wave function, which is the boundary wave function is just given by uh, uh, this boundary Lagrangian, and the bulk wave function is the solution of the Mati equation that we, we just saw. Now we do the standard thing of breaking uh, this integral into two regions, and in each of these regions, we approximate the wave function. And uh, by doing so, uh, we uh, get to the conclusion that uh, one point function in Sinch Horton is related to this combination of the one point function in Liouville plus uh, another term. And this is completely uh, finite now at p equal to zero. 
And one interesting feature is that this piece here is completely independent of the boundary parameters, okay? So it's very convenient to consider uh, the quantity, which is the one-point function of the Sinch Gordon relative to uh, the same one-point function, but with, with a, a reference uh, boundary parameter, so, such that this, uh, in this combination, this term cancels, and then you can uh, uh, just uh, compute it by looking at the Liouville uh, one-point functions, which are known exactly at full quantum. So then uh, the interesting quantity then to compare with our is this uh, combination here, uh, which is a full quantum uh, uh, result. So we know this at the full quantum level, so we can just set B equal to one in that case. And then we compare with the result of iterating or, or computing the uh, chief function by our Tracy Whedon TPA. And uh, if we do this numerically, uh, then we can compare this curve uh, for different boundary parameters with the points that we get from uh, analytically solving uh, the Tracy Whedon TPA and defining P in the way that I showed you through the central charge. So you see that, uh, well, uh, you might say that the agreement is not perfect and it's not meant to be perfect because uh, away from L equal to zero, you expect that the relation of P and L is just approximate. But since we have tried this for many, many different arbitrary uh, values of the parameters, we, we, we think this is a sort of an agreed amount and uh, we're happy with this. Uh, and uh, so this also serves as an interesting relation between the chief function and the FCCT states. And I think that one interesting uh, thing of uh, doing this is, for example, uh, when we uh, want to study excited states for the G function, so G function defined not just for the ground state. Uh, and there are two proposals in the market. There is one uh, by Kostov, Serban, Wu, and Gianco, Matsu, and Pescovi, and they do not quite agree with each other. Uh, and so, for example, this would be a good playground to, uh, to, to test. Uh, of course, you also have to learn how to generalize Tracy with TBA for excited states, or you just use the brute force formula. But I think this comparison with new field should be useful in this case, because in new field, you know pretty much everything. Okay. So, uh, as a final comment, let me um, uh, talk about the separation of variables. So this was a... Uh, uh, an observation that we have made, although this is notoriously incomplete. Uh, uh, basically, uh, there is a, a formula by Lukianov that uh, back in 2001, uh, in which he found a formula for one point function in Sims Gordon in finite form. And uh, this formula is given in terms of some separation of variable type form. So it's a multiple integral of a certain function. So when you specify this function, this uh, one-point function for the uh, identity operator, so that you get just the overlap of the ground state, uh, this formula has the following form that looks familiar, uh, resembles very much like a scalar product in a, in a spin chain. Sorry, could I just say it's like a bit better than multiple integrals because actually you can write it as a determinant of a single integral. Yes, yes, I, I will, I will uh, mention that. Um, so th this is defined in terms of a Q function, which is related to the Y function in this way, plus some van der Mond, uh, 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 pieces, okay? And then you have to take the large end limit. So here, I will not discuss convergence of this integral in this limit. Actually, it's not, uh, you have to regulate it somehow, but in the end, we are gonna use ratios of this uh, integral with some something on something else which uh, will make the final expressions uh, finite. But strictly speaking, there is some regularization implicit here. Uh, and uh, we can, using this uh, van der Mond formulas, we can write this. Uh, is there any good reason to call it Q function? I mean, it's, if left hand side Y function is closer to T function, like morally. Uh, well, I'm using the, uh, terminology that has been used by, for example, this was introduced, I think, in, by Zamolodchikov and then Ivan Ostov uh, also used it. I don't know if there is a, a deep reason. Well, it uh, doesn't just five bucks for equation in the usual way. So, uh, yeah. Right, right, there, there is an analog of, of the Baxter equation, yes. Uh, uh, but, but, 
what the novel comment. So basically, is this Q function is just what Q is justified or not finally? I mean, it is just Q. what? Huh? It is Q. But I used, I mean, why is it called that like TT over TT, right? And in this case, maybe it's TT times T maybe. Um. Oh. I do not recognize formula, like, I do not understand it. Which one? The second one? Right, this, this one plus the exponent equals Q plus plus Q minus minus. Um. Well, so there is, there is, uh, you can also, uh, so there is an analog of, of a Baxter equation which has the form of Q times T equal to Q with some shift plus Q with another shift. Uh, and so I think this is the closest to the Y function, but uh, um, Yeah, I'm using the, the terminology that that, uh, that is has been used in, in by many papers in, in the context of the central. Well, also you can start from x x z, and uh, there it is actually a few function of box of polynomial. Yeah, also the zeros of that expression should be the roots, right? Because it's y right. equal minus one, so maybe q, q is shifted. But So if you derive it as a limit of x x z, this will be literally a uh, box of the uh, polynomial. Okay. So, uh, uh, so using the Vandermond determinant formula to convert this into a determinant, we uh, we can express this overlap in terms of a determinant of a big matrix of a matrix of size two n plus one, where this matrix uh, has this form. Here. Uh, and what we observed is that in the case where this Q function is symmetric, it's parity symmetric, so in the case of uh, state that has this determinant actually factorizes into two pieces. Uh, a piece which is determinant of M minus, where M minus is a smaller matrix, and determinant of M plus is a determinant of uh, a matrix of size M plus one. And now uh, we made this observation. So this is uh, basically what we did. Uh, is there a okay. particular reason why you write Q of minus theta if it's uh, an even function? Uh, it's, well, if this, if this holds in this does not hold in general. The next, then the next equation also doesn't hold, so. <laughs> this equation? Yeah, this equation is only hold when it's symmetric. That's what yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So when, when it's parity symmetric, this determinant here factorizes. Yeah, so what is the reason to write the um, definition of M minus M plus with uh, minus theta? I well, mean, it's matter well, of taste, but it's a bit weird. Okay, let me just say what, why did, uh, did we write this in this way? Uh, uh, and there is an analogy with uh, the Godin norm for parity symmetric states. So when you compute the Godin norm uh, for states which have uh, this sort of property, one can show that the determinant factorizes into pieces. Determinant of G plus and determinant of G minus, where one of these determinants then is related to the overlap between a bulk state and a boundary state, the MPS state, matrix product state. So this has been shown in this paper. And uh, so just drawing the same type of analogy, we sort of conjecture that maybe uh, one of these pieces of this determinant is related to uh, the overlap between a bound state and a ground state. Okay. So that's just purely based on this analogy. There's no more reason for that. Now the question is, which factor do you pick? And there will be a reason. Uh, there will be a reason to pick one and not the other. And so uh, the conjecture goes that uh, the universal part of the G function, 
So the universal part, meaning the function, the part of the G function that does not depend on the boundary parameter, uh, is related to the determinant of this uh, m minus properly normalized uh, with some normalization factor that we are not able to fix, where we can rewrite this determinant of m minus in terms of a multiple integral of the separation variable time. So in going from here to to this integral representation, we just invert the same steps that we did before from using the, the term formulas. Okay. Uh, sorry, could I ask? So, so uh, in principle, we can start from XXZ model, and then there it's more or less known how to relate the SOV formula to the Gadan determinant. So, it's like yes, this yes, kind of conjecture or just looking at the derivation of this. Yes, I, I, I totally agree, and I think in particular, we were not able to fix this norm. and uh, starting from the discretization of the signature order and taking the continuum limit, perhaps we'll fix this uh, normalization. Uh, we are not, so this conjecture is notoriously incomplete because we're not specifying what is this normalization. Uh, but let me, before uh, concluding, let me make uh, some additional comments. So the reason why we pick this determinant M minus and not the M plus is that uh, uh, that this will vanish if the Q function is not parity symmetric. So, and this is related to the boundary states. I mean, integral boundary states are annihilated by uh, the action of both conserved charge, uh, uh, higher charges. Uh, and so, th this is the criterion to use to, to pick this term. But of course, uh, the proposal is notoriously incomplete because there's still. Uh, something to be fixed, and perhaps, uh, as Collio pointed out, starting from the discretization of the Simch Gordon is the way to, to, to do it. Uh, we found that this trick uh, actually uh, is good to find integral or SUV representations for boundary uh, overlaps in spin chains. For example, from the norm, and again, splitting them, well, if you start with a norm with SUV and splitting uh, in, in this way, you can also get an SUV representation for this overlap. And perhaps, perhaps uh, this type of trick uh, will be used for wiring spin chains where the norm is known. So perhaps if you study in those cases and see if that it factorizes, perhaps one of these factors will be related to the overlap uh, with, with a boundary state. Okay, so uh, that's basically it. So let me. Uh, uh, and with uh, some conclusions. So uh, I think for the future, of course, we, what we like is to extend this for more general types of kernels and theories that contain bound states or internal degrees of freedom. And in particular, the ultimate goal, and this was the real motivation for, uh, for our uh, case or for our uh, work was to uh, end up in n equal to four G function where there, I think we all would like to have some uh, formulation in terms of uh, some type of functional equations, either TBA or, or some more sophisticated methods. But I think if we can formulate a G-function uh, as an integral equation of TBA type, that's certainly a, a very, a very big gain. Uh, so the derivation is a little bit opaque in the sense that some of the functions, uh, like this eta, we have to introduce this eta. It's not clear what's the physical interpretation. Uh, so that would be interesting to, to explore a little bit more the physics of, of this relation, and in particular, uh, uh, perhaps going to the UV limit and learn how to solve these equations exactly in the UV limit, that would be perhaps useful, and that, that might be possible. The only uh, reason why we are not able to do is because in the UV limit of the Sinch Gordon, the Y functions are not flat. So if they were flat, I think we could use the standard eye temperature limits or eye temperature tricks that we often use in TBAs to solve it exactly. But in this case, we need to generalize that kind of trick. Another question is, uh, well, uh, there are still uh, some open ends on the excited states. There are, as I said, two proposals that do not quite agree. Uh, one interesting thing would be to generalize this Dori Tateo trick for outside its states, but apply it at the level of the Tracy Weaven TBA. So what happens if you do this kind of analytic continuation and pick some poles, and is this gonna give you the correct Tracy Weaven TBA for excited states? And perhaps, as I mentioned before, uh, Liouville would be a good playground to test. 
definitely we need to sharpen and improve this SUV conjecture. Uh, and and uh, that might be useful to guess higher rank overlaps from norms. And also there is a, a whole uh, vast uh, piece of literature on uh, applications of Tracy Witham in the context of uh, S3 partition functions in Sophia conformation assignments, uh, in particular in the case of OSP gauge groups. K plus uh, makes appearance there. Perhaps uh, uh, that will be uh, useful in so, uh, so I think that's it. Thank you very much for, for their attention. Okay. Thank you, Michelle, for the nice talk. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Uh, we have time for more questions. So this coefficient in this uh, SOV type of formula, which you, you don't know, is the indication that it is kind of simple or...? Um, so one difficulty to to test is that, uh, for example, each of these pieces in the large end limit are divergent. So only only the uh, the ratio was uh, is convergent. So one thing that we tried to do was to study the classical limit and uh, really compute this classical limit of this determinant and try to match with it with with that. And that didn't quite work, not by much. So that's why we think that there is something trivial here. In principle, we cannot say much about it. Because like, unless you say it's like in some sense simpler than another bit, it's, uh, I mean, I'm truly sympathetic to the determinant and obviously it's something uh, we were thinking as well and trying to test some kind of things that I wish this end was kind of trivial or simple. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I cannot say much about uh, And for spin chains, you said you made some tests. Uh, is it, do we have some, like for some, some simple states, right? It shouldn't be hard to compute. Uh, well, for the XXX, if you do this trick and you pick just one, one of these uh, pieces of these two factors, uh, yeah, the, the, then the coefficient uh, is, is simple. Um, um, and we also did that for the SL2 case, but again, there's always an ambiguity with respect to this proportional. This, this there's always something that you have to fix somehow, even okay, in the case of the XXX. Example, the left hand side is it like truly um, ambiguous, ambiguity free? If you like, I don't know, write your instead of taking log of bit on that equation, you take log of it or compute some function of bit on that equation and take the determine um, will it change the overall coefficient like naively probably not but who knows maybe uh, you see like there are two for two two ways to to define that then norm is like log of bit on that equation derivative or you just take bit on that equation and derivative because uh, uh -huh. well on shell it's one so maybe it's silly uh, uh, yeah, but once you have the G plus G minus, it could uh, be different, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, that, that I, I, I'm not exactly sure. Perhaps Schotter knows uh, a little bit better this. Schotter um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> Yeah, in this case, what we, we started with the SUV representation of uh, the XXX spin chain that is, uh, I guess it's uh, in, in your paper. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's the definition that we used for, uh, you know, for, for to, to derive a SUV representation for this guy. And there the coefficient was trivial. Okay. That's a good sign. <laughs> Uh, Joao? Uh, hi. So hi. I think that your machinery will work for the affine uh, TODA, JLN, GLN um, uh, affine TODA system with imaginary coupling. 
Okay, uh, well, um, um, yeah, I'm not sure, I don't remember what type of kernel does, does it show? Uh, well, this is um, uh, similar to the Cauch uh, uh, kernel, but with, uh, with phase, which is not pi divided by two, but pi divided by n. So uh, I think that you will have not uh, two sectors, but n sectors in uh, your uh, uh -huh. uh, questions. So maybe you will find also uh, this kind of uh, uh, functional equations. Actually, uh, uh, in any way, the, the TBA-like equations exist. And I think that they are written in, in the first papers by, uh, by Waffa Interligator and uh, Tchaikovsky. Yeah. So uh, I, I, what is not clear is if the boundary conditions uh, uh, allow to to use uh, the original TBA. I see. So this case where you have a cosh of uh, u minus u with a shift, which is of the form that you just mentioned, uh, it has also been a, it has also appeared in. In a different context of this um, uh, S3 partition function, there is a paper of Okuyama uh, mm -hmm. where they they found it. Uh, the additional thing that we have to do is that we need to consider a, a kernel for the tree function. When we consider the tree function, we have to consider a kernel that is of the form cosh of u minus v plus a shift plus cosh of u plus v plus that shift. So if you consider a federal determinant of value of uh, the kernel being just cosh of u plus v uh, with a shift or, or only cosh of u minus v plus a shift, I think that's uh, totally fine. But when you, you have to consider both, I think you have to generalize it a little bit. Uh, yes, yes. But, but in total, you, you have only difference. Ah, OK. So if you have only difference. Uh, there are several shifts. Then uh, you said uh, you will comment on the relation to Smirnov. So well, uh, you Smirnov. Nonlinear equation, right, for some kind of overlap. Yeah. Uh, is that right, so of the same type, or, or it's, a, it's a different beast? No, I, I think it's, it's totally different. I don't see uh, the, the connection with, with, with our work. And in particular, there's no, also n the connection with these Lukianov formulas is also not clear. Um, well, he, I think, wrote some conjecture of what it would be. He, he verified that their result agrees with this, but uh, to go from one to the other, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not clear. Well, it's also not clear in your case. I mean, I, I refer to no, no. the equation. Um, yeah, so I haven't looked at in, in, in detail to s try to see if there is a relation. Um, but I guess in, er in his case, is, is considering not, I mean, not in the presence of a boundary, right? It's, it's just considering, uh, you know. Uh, no, uh, definitely it's a different, a little. Uh, than than finite, finite temperature. I think it's a it's slightly different quantity. Well, you can say there is kind of defect rather than a boundary, right? So if you like, it's like periodic, but each time you gain a bit of phase, maybe. But I, 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 my impression is, perhaps I'm wrong, but uh, is looking at like an infinite cylinder, so you have just ground state, uh, like insertion of... Uh, yeah, but... You operate know. in the boat, but then infinite. Uh, anyway, yeah, but would be nice to if there was a relation, because then one can classify this... Uh, type of equation when they appear and to know better when you can expect a uh, simplification to a simple integral equation. Right. No, I, I, but we didn't look at that. All right, so I don't know uh, any more questions. So I can stop recording. Maybe there will be some informal discussion after. Let's thank Zhao uh, again. All right, I will.